tell me. Uh, hey everyone, uh, what's up, Goth Gamer Nation? It's it is I, your boy. I gotta tell you this uh, this one. Uh, yeah, sometimes these videos, you know, you get one and it's just it's it's just a son of a gun. And uh, this was one of them. So I I hope uh, I hope it's watchable. Have a good one. Here's the video. The Ring Terrors Realm is a third-person survival horror cartoon splat sound dot wave simulator, and it was developed by, according to the credits, Tycoon, and published by Asmic Ace Entertainment and Infograms for the Sega Dreamcast in the year 2000. It is loosely based on the Ring series of novels and subsequent films. This being a somewhat obscure Japanese game, its lineage is hard to track. Every website seems to list its developer as a different name. I don't know if Tycoon was actually some internal division within Asmic but they seem to mainly be a game and film distributor for films like the original Ring, and games as disparate as LCD Sound System for the PlayStation 1, and something called Jewel BEM Hunter Lime with Paint Maker. The fuck is that? Just like a visual novel. Okay. At one point, a Game Boy title was produced starring their pink dinosaur mascot, Boomer, called Boomer's Adventures in Asmic World, but even that was developed by a different team called Clon. So I don't know how to describe even the basic information that I start every video with. This seems to be the case with a lot of games like this and from this era. They just sort of appear out of the ether and everyone involved recedes to the shadows. Mergers will alter names and logos, and the creative breadcrumb trail is swept away from the corporate liminal space nightmare I imagine birthed it. You look up anyone in the credits, and most of the dev team, even those in higher positions, never worked on a game again, moving on to anime or film work. On release, The Ring Terror's Realm was universal panned. You'd be hard pressed to find a published review that wasn't surgically dismantling it, if you could even find one as it wasn't the most widely advertised game out there. The defunct website Planet Dreamcast wrote, As I spent hour after hour of my precious life force plowing through the ring, I just kept mumbling, how can there be this much hate in the world? Even the Dreamcast's proprietary magazine, Dreamcast Magazine, gave it a 2 out of 10, writing, The Ring Terror's Realm has so many things wrong with it, it would be useless to praise its good quality qualities if it had any. We once thought the idea of a murderous video game killing its players was a little far-fetched. Not anymore. Ironically, this same issue would be one of few publications to run a print ad for the game. IGN would provide one of the most forgiving write-ups, though still negative, calling the game the lowest rung on the ladder of Dreamcast survival horror games. Which would mean it would be seated pretty low, because by the year 2000, several survival horror games were offloaded onto the ill-fated console, like Shadow Man, Blue Stinger, D2, Carrier, Residents Evil 2, 3, and Code Veronica, Dino Crisis, Evil Dead Hail to the King, and Seaman. The Sega Dreamcast would be discontinued a year later for a number of reasons, despite sporting impressive hardware, a number of novel features like its visual memory unit, and beating other consoles to online gaming. Sega had burned a lot of goodwill with the failure of the Sega CD and Sega Saturn, two expensive consoles that put out a handful of oddball titles before being tossed aside when they didn't outsell the competition. Many believe this to be the reason big-name third-party studios like EA never brought their games to Dreamcast, leading to the console having a decidedly quirky library full of inventive but hardly marketable games, half of which weren't released outside of Japan. Adding to this was the advent of the PlayStation 2, which utterly steamrolled Sega in hype and marketing, and had a launch library that immediately appealed to the casual gamer. Not even their anxiety-inducing TV ads that seemed to have been created by Shodan could convince people to choose it over the PS2. There's something patently Sega about this ad campaign, scaring children into begging their parents for a Dreamcast for fear that it will emerge from under their beds. I'll swallow your fucking soul. Before the game starts proper, we're treated to a montage of clips over a sort of interesting trip hop song, and we're introduced to our protagonist, Egg. 
This game opens somewhere in the United States, probably. Egg calls her boyfriend Robert. They plan on celebrating her new job with the CDC, which Robert also works for. When they hang up, Robert's hand gets... Is he, uh, some, I don't something bad happens to it. She drives to his house and finds that he's dead. His skin taking on a reptilian looking texture and his face stuck in a rictus grimace. Just then, a man claiming to be a friend named Jack runs over and picks up Meg. The police have no idea what killed Robert, but claim it's unlikely it was a murder. The next day, probably, Egg is resolved not to mourn Robert's death and instead prove to her new employers that her boyfriend dying should in no way reflect on her ability to do whatever she's supposed to be doing here. Oh, Meg. I thought it was Egg. I thought her name was A. Meg just kind of spawns in Robert's old office, which she will be taking over, and soon receives a call from Jack. He mentions Robert's old computer and suggests she not touch it as two other CDC employees have recently died in the same gruesome way and all of them spent their final moments in front of their computer. Something I hope I have the privilege of doing. Just let me post one last bad gamer take before I go. All three died while running a program called Ring. The police tried to see what this program was, but it would not boot for them. The game hasn't really established why Jack knows any of this or what his deal is, but I guess we had to learn this information somehow. Having received his cryptic warning about the laptop, Meg does what anyone in their right mind would do and immediately opens it, where the Ring program seems to boot up and requests a name. Thinking it must be some sort of video game, she puts her name in only to black out and wake up in some kind of space age storage pod clad in a military uniform and armed with a gun. Another man in a similar outfit waits in the room, and you have one of many frustrating interactions where these brigade members, as they are labeled, try to rally you to help them in their cause, claiming they're in a battlefield and that she has to help them survive against the enemy. Meg is utterly lost as to what's happening. Despite clearly experiencing some kind of tactile interactive phenomena, she's just like, I'm sorry, I'm on the computer right now. Are you an email? The nameless soldier sends Meg upstairs to deal with an enemy, which is revealed to be some kind of monstrous ape creature. And upon returning to him, she passes out and wakes up slumped over in the chair back at Robert's office. Odds are a lot of people that purchased the Ring Terror's realm outside of Japan did so either unaware of the other Ring media, or at least aware of the original film, in which a reporter investigates a cursed videotape that kills you seven days after you watch it. A curse propagated by the vengeful spirit of an abused and murdered girl named Sadako. There was also a more faithful TV movie from 1995 that is interesting as a bizarre time capsule, but it is filmed with consumer grade video cameras, giving it the feeling of watching some weird snuff film you found in the walls of a condemned building, which has its charm, I suppose. If you're looking at this footage and wondering why this game hardly seems to reflect the grim Japanese ghost story depicted in the, at the time, four ring films, this game has very little in common with those and rarely rarely references them outside using a few clips during cutscenes, sharing more DNA with the books, which wind up slanting towards a somewhat convoluted sci-fi-tinged medical mystery like Parasite Eve, and less like a straightforward horror story about a spooky ghost, as far as I can tell. I, I didn't read them because they weren't a first-hand account of an alien abduction or a World of Darkness lore book, and thus did not interest me. In these books, Sadako's curse is investigated and studied as a supernatural virus that seems to mimic things like smallpox and even AIDS. With every book, there is an escalation or mutation of sorts that brings the originally small idea into a larger and larger universe. The films do deviate from the books, but not for lack of trying. This is why there are technically two Ring 2 movies. After the success of both the novels and the TV version, Toho planned to cash in on the Ring phenomenon really fast, and released adaptations of Ring and its sequel Spiral at the same time. The problem was, people didn't really vibe with Spiral. Uh, they were written by two different people, and it tries to course correct the changes in the first movie to be more in line with the books, so even though it includes substantial input from Spiral's author Koji Suzuki, and he even gets a little cameo in it, the reintroduction of the 
sci-fi and medical elements and its contrast next to the more paranormal, mystery-focused Ring led to Spiral being quickly discarded and replaced by Ring 2, which reunites much of the cast and crew of the first movie and again focuses on spooky ghosts and psychic curses. Both are interesting enough to watch, if only to see the franchise branch in two directions, one carrying out someone's artistic vision and one caving to audience criticism. In any case, Terror's Realm could be more easily described as a loose adaptation of the third book, Loop, in which a virtual reality life simulation program spreads a fast-acting cancer to all who created it, which would be the simplest terms I could describe that book without spoiling the entire series as it makes some wild choices that have interesting implications for the rest of the series. Speaking of spoilers, if you have any interest in playing this game without knowing how the plot plays out, you can feel free to skip to this time, just in case I wind up comparing them. Probable spoilers for the Ring franchise in general, yeah, I, I, I don't plan to, I just I can't tiptoe around every fandom. What a, What am I? Some kind of a... Huh? What's this? Interesting. Some kind of a unmarked file download. Could be anything. Could be a virus. Some kind of Trojan worm boot sec... Oops, I clicked it. Okay. It's like some kind of art student's short film or something. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll let the machine get it. I have a machine, right? Hi, thanks for calling. Uh, I don't have an answering machine, Fuck. so if you'd like to leave a message... Uh... Huh. Well... Meg awakes thinking that her experience inside Ring was just a video game, and that Jack is playing some kind of joke on her. I don't quite follow her logic here, even if she never touched a video game in her life, I would assume she'd have to know that in the act of playing a game, you don't usually pass out and wake up inside a game, no matter how many times you club yourself over the head. It's like, no matter what, you, you're still here, where everything's blurry and confusing. After an apparent power outage, Meg gets a familiar phone call warning her of her death in seven days. One of the other employees, Chris, brings Meg to meet the chief of the CDC who explains that because of the three mysterious deaths, they are performing an internal investigation to determine if the deaths were caused by a virus. So it looks like Meg's first day is going to be a little complicated as the surrounding area is being evacuated and the building quarantined for a few days. In the meantime, she's free to wander around and meet the rest of the crew, most of which are ultimately irrelevant to the plot. Somewhat important is the security guard Lucino and your office neighbor Peter. After visiting the facilities at an alarming speed. Jack calls to check in again, and Meg displays a profound ability to discount her experiences, claiming her time inside a ring was just a dumb game and that she got a prank call afterward. Get used to that, by the way. This is default Meg for most more of this story than you'd think. The one tidbit Jack is able to provide in this conversation is that Robert's body was handed over to the CDC so they could determine if a virus killed him. I was planning on covering this in, in a later section, but all along the way so far, the dialogue has been a little odd, but odd in that way that other survival horror games of the era were, in a strange but understandable sort of way. This was sometimes a little silly. What is this? What is it? Blood. And other times it worked to the benefit of the subject matter. Uh-huh. Have you seen a little girl? So I think I gave this game the benefit of the doubt a little longer than I should have, thinking, yeah, this will iron itself out. Or, uh, I bet there's a vibe they're cultivating here. It's just... <sighs> I don't think there was a vibe. Do you want anything, Meg? I'm sorry to bother you when you're so busy. I wanted to ask you something about Robert. About Robert? Did something happen in regards to him? 
Yes. I heard that Robert's body had been handed over to this laboratory. Robert's body? Yes. If that was the case, I want to see him. Ming. I can understand how you feel, but can you spare us? This is no playground. I have plenty of work other than Robert's case. Yes, I know. But I wanted to look into it as well. You're not responsible for him, Mick. There are many other specialists here at CDC, not just you. Or can you not trust any of them? No, that's not how I meant it. I... I was just regretting what happened to Robert. I couldn't forget what happened. I know it's a personal affair, but I wanted to find out the truth firsthand. The police started rambling nonsense that a program called Ring was suspicious. May, I don't know what you heard from where, but I'm busy! Ring? A computer program? I have no idea what you're talking about. You're getting in the way of my work. Get out of here and cool off your hot head in your lab. I can clearly say that you are not sane! Uh, um, I'm sorry for mouthing off like that. Meg, didn't you hear me? Get out of this room. Go cool off your head for a while! Yes, I'm terribly sorry. I apologize for bothering you when you are so busy. Back to exploring, in one of the labs we find an unattributed diary that mentions a rumor floating around that a security guard died after watching an 8mm video. I found a strange 8mm film in the reference room drawer and watched it. But can it be that was it? Afterwards, I felt bad from a prank. Oop. Uh oh. So whoever wrote this showed Robert and the other victims the cursed video, but in an 8mm copy, which by the book's rules should function the same, I suppose. The whole cursed VHS tape thing is a fixation the films have, and not a recurring idea throughout the books. The host of this virus changes multiple times, at one point even to a book about the events of Ring called Ring. This note, and another scientist you meet named Timothy, make it clear that Meg needs to get into this restricted reference room. So with Timothy's help, Meg is able to open Robert's locker and retrieve a key to this room and a note implying that he attempted to find the video again but was unable able to. In the reference room, we find a file that essentially details a mashup of the events of the first film and book, the ring phenomenon. So like the film, a girl with psychic abilities named Sadako transferred a curse to a videotape in her grief and anger that kills the viewer with a heart attack seven days later. After a few different variations of abuse and trauma, she is thrown into a well. In the books, I think she was alive in the well for 20 years, and in the film, she's alive for 30 years somehow. I don't know, you know, how she ate, got food for 20 or 30 years. Maybe she had a, a telepathic link with like a network of rats that would daisy chain stolen bread to her. That just sounds adorable. I hope that's what happened. This is a good story. However, they do then conclude that she likely had smallpox and the tape's curse is a virus, so they are sort of trying to have it both ways. The CDC obviously can't determine how this is possible, but they have stocked up on books about telekinesis and shit. More surprisingly, they have access to Sadako's body, which they've been prodding at to try to understand the virus. Meg returns to Timothy to bring him up to speed, but he has no fucking idea what she's talking about, and is so confused by the ring game and the curse that he just disappears from the story completely. At a loss as to what to do next, she tries playing the game again, this time doing a little more exploring outside of the initial spawn point, and it becomes clear that in this world, she's in some kind of post-apocalyptic version of the CDC building. Back in the regular CDC, Meg is chewed out by the chief for breaking into the reference room, but she's able to lie her way out of further punishment. Outside the door, she passes out and wakes up sometime later to find the building experience some more power issues. When she returns to her office, she finds someone rifling through her stuff. They knock her over and run off, leaving behind a level 2 keycard. In between exploring and making friends with some of the other technicians, 
they call themselves, so I guess that's what they are. Meg is drawn back and forth between the waking world and the ring world, where she continues to regard it as a video game despite the pleas of the other characters stuck there that she assumes to be NPCs. Outside of the ring, these experiences don't seem to affect her or concern her past the mild side effects. Headaches, heartburn, upset stomach, angry lung, betrayed brain, liver damage, spinal damage, heart damage, burn damage, pain damage, drowsiness, dry mouth, wet eyes, muscle pain, chills, thrills, fever, bleeding from the nose, bleeding from the ears, bleeding from the mouth, bleeding from the pores, increased bleeding, dizziness unrelated to increased bleeding, dizziness because of increased bleeding, increased bleeding because of dizziness, insomnia, hypersomnia, tingling in the fingertips, loss of fingers, phantom fingers, haunted fingers, full finger apparition, no fingers, finger pain, too many fingers, bleeding from the fingers, tendency to shoot blood out of the fingers as a defense mechanism, dizziness from shooting too much finger blood, hallucinations, hallucinations of finger blood, frequent urination, frequent pissing. Chatting with the gals from the office, Meg learns about the building's basement. A rumor is going around that they are keeping people hospitalized down there as guinea pigs after they were exposed to a virus. This rumor goes hand in hand with the one about a security guard watching an 8mm film that imparted a physical virus on them before they mysteriously disappeared. Because of inter-office gossip, the whole ring incident seems to be an open secret, though one nobody thinks of as more than a ghost story. In the midst of this conversation, Meg begins to see a little girl that the others don't acknowledge. She giggles and says she's waiting for her underground. Sneaking downstairs, she does find several creepy patients muttering about seven days, something about a back room and being experiments. Some of them are bedridden or clearly dead already. While snooping, Meg eavesdrops on a conversation between the chief and Peter. They discuss being close to understanding how the virus works and thus being able to control it. Since they seem to be doing the rounds down here, Meg decides to take the opportunity and look around the reference room further, finding a mysterious 8mm film. Jack calls and attempts to fill you in on what he's discovered, but it's a bunch of shit we already know, including the fact that Sadako's body is in the building somewhere. Which Meg is surprised to hear even though we read the report that said that. Maybe she just wanted to give Jack a, a win or something, but this seems like a very pointless phone call to just drive home the basic info in case you blacked out for the last two hours of gameplay. Lucino enters and tells Meg that they are initiating some kind of lockdown and words it very poorly, which scares Meg into thinking they might be onto her snooping, so she runs off to watch the 8mm video. I mean, I guess it, it can't make things worse if she's already cursed after going into the ring world. Speaking of which, after watching this, she's just sort of transported there without accessing a computer after the little girl appears behind her. This time she runs into Jack, who seems just as confused as she is, claiming he just got in the game and doesn't know what's happening. Like many a Let's Player on YouTube, he skipped the opening cutscene and tutorial, and now he's complaining about how the game sucks. For once, two thirds into the game now, Meg begins to have a crisis, unsure of the reality of either world, and passes out, waking up on a table in front of the Chief and Peter. They are rather forthcoming about the virus and their intentions. It seems there was a misunderstanding when Lucino was sent to get Meg. Having confirmed that there is indeed a virus, every employee is to receive a blood test. He was merely supposed to lead her to get tested, but seemed to think the correct way to phrase that would be, I need to hold you down. It's like even, even canonically, these people don't know how to speak like humans. Peter implies that they have no idea what exactly causes the infection and that it might be, there is no cause of the infection. The chief once again becomes enraged when she asks about the ring. There is no method of infection? Is it a curse? Bang! You've been mentioning computer programs and curses lately! And you call yourself a research scientist? Unhand me, peasant! While waiting for your test results, Lucino comes in to apologize about the misunderstanding earlier and reveals that he and Robert used to be friends. He's been sort of watching over Meg out of concern because she's getting mixed up in the same things Robert did before his death. But to honor his friendship, I guess, he offers to help Meg by shutting down the building's power for a few minutes, allowing her to sneak into this back room that's been hinted at. Jack sends Meg a fax about Sadako's origin that vaguely touches on plot points from the film, theorizing she may have received her ability to impart the curse from the mistreatment of her mother, Shizuko also a psychic. With some time to kill before their plan to cut the power, Meg decides to finish playing the ring game. I think she's just into it now. Someone should tell her about the, like Resident Evil. Inside ring, she sees the little girl again and is led to the first guy you came across. Meg asks what she needs to do to finish the game, further confusing him. He finally spells out that Meg's mission was to enter something called Loop and extract a vaccine from Sadako. Turns out this shitty dilapidated version of the world is the real one, one where Sadako's curse has ravaged the earth and turned most of humanity into gibbering monsters. Meg has been using a program called 
loop to enter a digital recreation of the past built from Sadako's memory in the hopes of determining the vaccine and bringing it into the present, but somewhere along the way she became confused about which timeline was reality. Yeah, it's a convoluted twist and it's not portrayed, revealed all that well, but it's also not that difficult to comprehend and like most aspects of the story, you probably got there long before Meg did. In fact, even after this interaction, she's left completely bewildered. Before leaving, you confront the little girl who reveals herself to be the reincarnation of Shizuko, Sadako's mother, who again explains to an exasperated Meg that this is the real world, and the other world was a virtual world. Also in this one, Robert is still alive, but he'll only last another two days unless she goes back into loop and gets the vaccine from Sadako. Back in, I guess, loop world, Lucino shuts off the power so Meg, now equipped with a gun that materialized on her desk, races over to the once locked back room. In there, the same monsters from the other world begin to appear. Meg, still not having grasped that this is a virtual world, expresses guilt that she was forced to kill someone, even with Shizuko assuring her it doesn't matter. She's like, not only was that person a demon monkey, but none of this is real. I can't stress how wild it is to be nearing the end of the game and the protagonist is still just clueless about what's happening. She's just, she's such a frustrating main character. It's like, even when it seems as though she's at least accepting parts of the story, she does so apathetically. Like, you know what? I don't even care. I don't even care what's real anymore. I'm just gonna do this because what other option is there? I don't even wanna be around anymore. And Meg is like the only real character in this game, so it's frustrating that our anchor, our rock, is, is, like, is a slippery little fish. I feel like maybe I missed a scene where they explain who the fuck Jack is and why he's helping us, and I even watched someone else's playthrough and nothing. Then I had the thought, I bet in the booklet or some shit they include some sentence that clarifies everything. And then I remembered that I have that booklet and could look, and sure enough it explains that Jack, Jack Nixon, by the way, is his full name. He's a journalist and Meg's ex-boyfriend. It says, Jack helps Meg search for the cause of his friend Robert's death. He also started to play The Ring and has been drawn into its deadly game. Yeah, how is he playing the game? So back in the front of the manual, it says, all four of the lab workers died while playing The Ring a new computer game. So did Jack literally go to Circuit City and buy a game called Ring and install it, agree to the terms and services and play it? Cause clearly in the real world, he was probably, you know, trying to find the vaccine along with Meg and they're like ex partners. So did they get into this loop world, uh, forget what their mission was, hook up, become gamers, and then the game they happened to both play was like the other world equivalent of loop that sent them from ring did no, I get it. I, I get it. Behind a secret doorway in the chief's office, Meg finds another secret lab area and is confronted by the chief. Just another effort. One more step and the work is over. I'll be the one who controls the virus. Virus? What? What are you talking about, chief? Come on, Meg. You at least know there's a virus. I barely think I understand what's happening, but I know there's a virus. You know what? You're egg again. Until you've proven you can be Meg, you're egg. The chief goes on some rant about the power and the force of the virus and being in control of it before turning into one of the monsters. I don't really know what he planned to do with it. Like, he wants it for himself, but also wants to infect the planet with it. The important part is he's dead and Meg expresses the first intelligent observation about the events of Terror's Realm. There's another room down here where Sadako's body is being kept. Shizuko expresses that she doesn't really know what Sadako wants, but that she probably just hates humanity enough to be fine with their complete extinction. In the middle of this conversation, Sadako seems to wake up. I have to go now. My planet needs me. Yeah, I wish I could just eject myself from awkward conversations like these two do. See ya. Meg fights her way past many monkeys to reach the roof of the CDC. While Shizuko empathizes with her, you know, getting why she would want to destroy all life, she does insist that you find a way to stop her. She wants her daughter's suffering to end for her to rest. Hey, you didn't... You didn't do the thing. We blow up Sadako. On her deathbed, she hands over a cartoon vial of the vaccine in the classic... 
you know, test tube with the cork at the end. This is something that froze my brain. Blue screen of death, red ring of death, regular death, I die. It's not so much that this happened. I, I just realized how lost I really was because we're in a simulation of a memory right now. So this is not the real Sadako. This is a recreation of her, which we defeat by shooting a grenade at. So she then falls on the floor, condemns humanity further before handing over the cure for the supernatural natural curse virus that she created and that she kept in her robe in a little vial and so <coughs> and so now Meg is going to take this into the real world and then reverse engineer it why did she have this vaccine how did she make the vaccine did she make it did something did somebody else is her virus an actual tangible thing that can literally be treated the same way you would treat any other virus and then why did she give it to meg i feel like they were going for some wildly mishandled empathetic moment where meg's compassion is enough to get sadako to back down from destroying humanity but also we blew her up not moments ago i and also wasn't she already dead even in this simulation? This is a digital recreation of a ghost? I, I don't know why, but I really want to cry right now. I'm not mad. I think I'm just frustrated because I don't get it, but it's also not that difficult to comprehend. Why would Sadako give a shit about Meg if we literally just gunned her down? Us Americans, I swear, we'd rather blow up a child with a bazooka than put her in therapy. I think once she hands you the virus, she turns into a crow? I... I don't know. I have no way of confirming that. I have no way of confirming if Sadako's dead computer ghost is now a crow. I'm sorry. The most charitable thing I could say concerning this game's story is that it attempts to tell a quite ambitious one. The way it does that, the amount of effort and care it puts into that, is suspect. But taking a popular franchise and honing in on its more cerebral and philosophical elements while trying to cram that into a by-the-numbers Resident Evil clone is something impressive in concept. I do feel like that matters little as just about every aspect of this game is incompetently bungled through genuinely comedic cutscenes so bereft of quality that it borders on legit satire. Dialogue that, even though it's in English and I can read it, I, I still feel like I have to run it through some internal translation program in my brain, and scattered, vague, often misspelled or poorly formatted documents. And at the center of this is Egg, a character that simply refuses to understand this game's story despite every character screaming it at her, who even in the game's final moments doesn't seem to entirely understand her place in the plot, and doesn't seem like she even wants to participate in it. There is some fatal flaw in this game's story beyond its inability to tell one, beyond its inability to cultivate some kind of atmosphere or tension. Maybe it's the fact that even if you know the basic premise of the ring, you're gonna consistently be 10 steps ahead of the protagonist for most of the game, and when it departs into things from the books, even though you'll catch on quick, you still have to endure multiple scenes of characters telling Egg what's happening, and her going, huh? A virus? No, I'm Egg. I'm wondering how much thought they put into this adaptation, if there was a thought process behind not doing something straightforward, like putting you in some kind of haunted building where you fend off ghosts, the kind of themes and visuals I'd argue most would associate with the ring, and instead focus on the story of Loop, the complex meta conclusion to the original trilogy, which is the least conventionally spooky. The only thing I could come up with is that the story of Loop is the closest the franchise gets to Resident Evil. It's an excuse to have a group of well-armed military types wandering around some kind of biochemical lab full of monsters, mutated by a mysterious virus. I guess it's also simultaneously tapping into some themes covered in Silent Hill. You have two worlds, one more idyllic, and one that is a corrupted reflection of the other, where a mistreated little girl has twisted the image of a location's previous occupants. It doesn't come up in this game, but in the films they also do a thing where Sadako is split into a good and bad version, which I guess isn't strictly a Silent Hill thing, Fatal Frame did that as well, but I just want you to know there are no longer original ideas left in the world, and that's okay. It's just such an odd deviation. I can see 
the train of thought that could lead here, but at no point did it feel like they got there naturally or without Frankensteining in some kind of wild motivation. At several moments, a character would explain some piece of lore or monologue about their intentions in that broken, uncanny way, and I'm just grimacing and nodding through it, and it kind of looks like that's what she's doing too. The way she's just kind of stuck with an eerie grin on her face. <laughs> Yes, hello. Oh, fuck, why did I answer? Hello, have we reached the home of Earth? Activator, Grime, Bear? If so, please stay on the line. Alright, I, I guess that's me. Thank you for your patience. If you watched a cursed video in the last 24 hours, please press 4, 4, 4, 2, 0, 6, 9. I'm sorry I didn't quite get that. We are committed to delivering you your untimely paranormal death as soon as possible. Please press 4, 4, 4, 2, 0, 6, 9, 8. Thank you. Please stay on the line while we process your account. We're sorry. All our operators are currently busy. We are committed to effectively enacting swift psychic vengeance. Please stay on the line to keep your place in queue. Uh, yeah, fine. The Ring Terror's Realm is obviously one of the more wonky Resident Evil clones. It imitates much of the RE DNA while predictably flubbing much of it, ending up with a poorly rendered sketch approximating that game's gameplay. Meg is controlled appropriately like a tank, moving through environments with fixed camera angles, but even that is somehow more unwieldy than other clones. She'll get caught on the edges of objects and corners and need to be rocked out of them. There's this underwater-like lack of mobility and things like turning around, and Entering a new area presents you with a familiar animation where you watch a door open, but unlike Resident Evil, it will sometimes just hang on the shot of the door for what feels like ages until you start to question if the game froze. You collect healing items, ammo, and keys, and they are stored in a familiar looking limited inventory. If you want to make room for a new weapon or something, you can place excess items in familiar looking chests found throughout the building. These can also be accessed in the non-apocalyptic world, but they aren't necessary until the last stretch of the game. Like Resident Evil during combat, you have one button to raise your weapon and another to fire it, but this does differ in some ways that are simultaneously a legitimately clever addition, but also another showcase for frustrating jank. For much of your time in the ring world, you will be in the dark, but you can find batteries to power your shoulder-mounted flashlight. The real downside of using it is that enemies will be attracted to it and make a beeline for you when it's on, meaning you could leave it off and slip past many of them. You just not be able to see all that well yourself. This sort of inadvertently grants this game something like a stealth mechanic. Enemies do respawn at odd intervals, but it was never often enough that I felt it necessary to conserve ammo. The way this loops back around to combat is that you need your light on to aim a weapon. You have a nocturne style aim assisted laser sight that ideally should lock onto an enemy when it's close enough. This often does not work and Meg will fire rounds through an enemy's legs or into the wall behind it allowing it to get close to you and hit you, which will frequently get you stunlocked in your hit animation. It was very rare that I was ever hit just once by an enemy. If they're close enough to get you once, you're gonna be there for a while. It's not always as easy as just running away to put distance between them. Sometimes I just enter a room and walk into an enemy that immediately hits me before I even have control of Meg again.
I feel like they anticipated this being annoying and included the ability to take a single pathetic hop backwards, something I would do on accident many times from being turned around after a camera angle change. But in combat, even this requires time to recover and raise your weapon again, or maybe reload, and that's usually the exact amount of time it takes an enemy to get right back in front of you. Honestly, it's not like it's a relentlessly unpleasant game to play, in fact there's unavoidably something comfortable and familiar about it. I've done this before. I've done things like this before. I've done things that remind me of this. Somewhere in here is the vaporous memory of some better game. I was distracted by it enough to not realize until the end of the game that there wasn't anything in the way of puzzles, even basic item based ones. The closest it came to some challenge beyond shooting monsters was trying to find hidden quest items, some of which you can't see all that well unless you use the first person view. There is however a very consistent and accessible pace to it. It's somehow easy to keep playing it and for your morbid curiosity to propel you through it. Like you found some strange, archaic, but anachronistic piece of technology. I kept thinking, I wonder what it's gonna do next, this thing that aspires to be a video game. I'd wager this is a me problem, but many of the hallways and offices of the CDC building look very indistinguishable from one another, and even with a map in which I appear as a little arrow, I still found myself doubting every corner I turned and rechecking the map because you know, we're just heading from one grey hallway to another. Characters will tell me to go to specific rooms in the building, and I don't know where the fuck that is. Is it this grey room or this other identical grey room? <laughs> even when they're labeled, I don't know what the fuck they are. What's an opera room? And a microscope room? What's it? Oh. I don't want to go in there. The Ring Terror's Realm is not the worst looking game on the console. Characters are detailed enough, there are some interesting textures on display, especially in the grimy, rusty, Silent Hill adjacent ring world. There is a lot working against it though, and not from a graphic quality standpoint, just a lack of design sense. It's kind of interesting that one of the many things it borrows from Resident Evil is the sort of simplistic expression animations characters display, where they'll you know, put a hand on their hip, or shrug, or point at someone with their entire claw hand. I don't mean to say this is poorly done in either game, but it shows how little they wanted to make it their own, or, you know, use this new technology to advance or alter something from a five-year-old game. The ring is full of these stock rooms that are copied and pasted several times over, and many don't even serve a purpose. Intentional or not, I guess it does begin to impart this monotonous and escalating claustrophobia once you realize that the whole game takes place in rooms that all look the same. If text is incorporated, it's almost always humorously butchered. You can head to the restaurant and pick from staples like hamburger sandwich, italan, Chinese, salad jelly, and drink. I don't think there's anything visually offensive outside of the game's cutscenes, which are so spectacularly mishandled in just about every regard that I don't know how to properly express this to you other than to, in gratuitous detail, examine what happens in one. I'll use the opening one. Well, let me back up even further. So when you boot the game up, there is that montage of clips set to some music, which is fine, nearly promising, but then you get to the title screen and as if warning you, telling you outright how much heart went into this game's production. This is the sound that happens when you press start. I didn't add that. I didn't go to www.funnysoundsforfree.com and download a dot wave of this splat noise. That's the first noise they wanted you to hear after your first bit of input. Do you understand? You've probably heard this sound already because it's so pervasive throughout the game, but it's just the misstep that ties everything together, you know? It's the mascot of this game's failures. It's like the video game equivalent of the Saint Anger snare, continuously reminding you that this just doesn't work. Something is wrong. Anyway, the opening cutscene. At first, it's not aggressively strange. Well, it's a little strange that there's no music or room tone or anything. Well, who the hell does she think she is? She hasn't any idea of how important this project is. But then Robert is shocked by something happening off screen and starts dying. The camera zooms into his stationary eye while he impotently screams, Oh! No, no. Immediately cut to a crusty stock engine sound. <laughs> then there was a cut where a different quality sound effect plays much louder. 
still weird that there's no music or anything helping this mix sound less raw and cheap. Oh, Robert. Then they do another cut to a louder sound effect, this time so jarring that it may as well be a jump scare. Well, today is the day he has to make up for it. Meg sees that there are cops outside Robert's place and says, what? But for some reason, the first half second of her voice line is cut off. So it's just, uh. what? Then there's this cop with insane eyes, you know, where you can see the, the full white all around the pupil and just kind of muttering to himself. Yeah, I think we're just gonna have to do it that way. And that's just a, hey. Again, I feel like there was supposed to be music or something to drown some of this out. He sees Meg crossing the barrier and calmly tells her she can't enter, but Meg's voice actor really plays up him grabbing her, so it seems awkwardly rough. Hey, miss. No, I'm sorry, you can't come in here. <laughs> Jesus, he's a fucking gonna gonna killer. Get... These are just the strangest, most uncanny cops. You're gonna have to get out of here, or do you live here? What's happened, officer? What's happened, officer? You gotta get out of here, or do you live here? I guess there must be a reason you try to get in here. Let's start over. Hi, I'm a cop. What's your business here? No! I can't believe it's Robert! No! You okay, lady? This, this is like comedic timing on top of them cutting to a wide shot of the two cops standing over her. It's, it's, it's like a fucking Wes Anderson movie. It is designed to be funny. Jack is kind of the highlight of this one. The rest of the cutscene is an exasperated conversation between two characters who sound like they maybe don't speak English and are reading it out phonetically. And in the same room, by the way, they talk over each other. Like, hey man, what's happening here? Now hold on a moment, sir. I know the two of them. They're friends. What happened? Uh I don't believe this! I see. Okay. It's unlikely Carry to be a homicide now. case. Not a murder? Then what's that? Did you see his face? What's happened? Oh my god! Well, we'll get to the bottom of this. I think that is just a frame of black they left in the video file as well, but that's just... Then what's that? If, if we're nitpicking, maybe don't... Maybe don't want those. They then just hard cut to Meg later saying, I'm still alive! I'm still alive. I'll work for this company without you, Robert. Like, was that ever in question? I, I don't. I didn't think you had died. Or did she mean that as a backhanded remark aimed at her dead boyfriend? Well, I'm still alive and able to go to work, unlike your dead ass. You then have your ears blown out once again as you get your first taste of this game's soundtrack. Outside of the handful of cutscenes, there is no voice acting, which is a real shame because I can only imagine how much of a treat it would be if the entire game featured this caliber of voice acting. It would unironically elevate this experience far past what it is. The music is not great, consisting of short tracks that sound like they should be incidental music or snippets used as some kind of dramatic stinger just looped endlessly. This led to some silly moments where the loop would restart while I was doing something as unremarkable as looking at a toilet. Some are better than others and almost feel like a seamless loop, but the best you can hope for is that you reach some meditative state where you stop thinking about it. I feel like somebody there, at least one person, cared about the music. Or may maybe not cared, but had interesting ideas. That brief little musical montage. Well, it's unlikely to be a homicide case. And the end credit song, I think show that. But the end credits track is also not a unique song. It plays during the final boss fight. So by the time you hear it, you're probably sick of it. Another shame because uh, the ring movies end with some, some slappers. <laughs> I think the amount of time you have to put up with is 
too much though. It's enough to dominate my memory of not just the music, but the game itself. This is what I'm gonna hear when I see this cover art. In order to huh? keep track of your file, please state your case number clearly. Case number? Please state your case number now. The fuck are you talking about? Can you give me a case number? Thank you. One moment. Our records show you were present for the viewing of a cursed and or paranormally enhanced video and are to be given seven business days to live. Okay. Grace, let me get that started for you. There is a transaction fee oh, of up to five. This game was not as bad as I expected. I could say the same. The only thing I knew prior to playing this game is that it was kind of a train wreck. And some guy named Forkknife or some shit at one point made a video about it. But I would agree that it was not as bad as I was expecting. This wouldn't make me give it a 4 out of 5 stars, however, as I do have a shred of cognitive ability. Were they aiming for the worst game on the system? Okay, the graphics are nice, but everything else just stinks majorly it is the most hideous translation on the entire dreamcast and seriously flawed plot lines and pacing problems abound in fact you can see exactly where the developers and programmers wanted to go it could have been a very intriguing mystery survival horror mix with just enough difference from the resident evil silent hill genre to keep it interesting they just needed to have a brain in their heads before the project began i don't have a good read on these developers the more i talk about video games on the internet the more i've reined in the reactionary AVGN impulse to say obviously this was made as a cheap cash grab and it's heartless and soulless and a bunch of ass but I know so little about all parties involved so I, I don't know if I can make the call in good conscience that it's uh that it's that so I'll just do it in bad conscience boring this game is super boring and it reminds me of an old DOS PC game. Lame, and after trying it once, I never played it again. I, I, I suppose I agree with you, but there were so many amazing DOS games and I know that's not why we're here, so I'm just gonna uh, grin and nod along that the, uh, the main thrust of your review uh, is, is accurate. I, I don't like how we got there. A decent survival horror genre game for the Dreamcast. What I like most about the game is it follows closely to its original source material for the storyline from the movies and just switching the tape for a PC game. What I dislike about the game is that it is a little harder to control the characters when compared to a game like Resident Evil Code Veronica for the Dreamcast. I decided to buy this game to add to my collection, plus I thought it might be a nice game to play and see how it stacked up to the original Ring movie it's based off of. I mean, I know we're out of the spoiler zone, but like that's not exactly what the point of this game was. That actually sounds like an interesting idea. Well, not interesting, but straightforward enough that you can make a half decent clone out of it. Just like a whole game of that episode of X-Files where they go into the VR game. I swear, you, you've lowered my opinion of this game by, by even making me think of that possibility. Laughter is the best medicine with guest star Tina... T what an awful game. Seriously, if you like horror games and don't want to have a headache for the rest of your life, avoid playing this game at all costs. The only reason I purchased it was to review how awful it is. This game rips off Resident Evil in every way possible and then mixes it all into a blender that already has enough crap in it to cause it to overflow with a horrible stench. Of course, the taste in your mouth is just overwhelming and you never want to take another sip in your life. The voice acting was awful. It sounded like they took the cleanup crew of the company's building and had them voice the characters. The graphics make the PlayStation 1 look like a god, and the music sounds like my little six-year-old brother pounding his head on a keyboard. There is nothing good about this game. My YouTube account will have a full vi- well, hey, hey, no free plugs. <laughs> If you are a fan or nostalgic for this wave of survival horror games, you could do worse than The Ring Terror's Realm, but like not a lot worse. I'm enamored enough with the genre that I certainly wouldn't say I didn't get anything out of my time playing this game. I'm glad I did. There is the faint but lingering sensation that I'm playing something like a lost Resident Evil or Silent Hill, but it's built with stolen or shoddily recreated materials, something that studiously took notes from its contemporaries but had little heart or imagination of its own, putting not much more thought into it than, hey, people seem to like those, we should make one of those. Aside from some nice lighting and some 
some interesting source material, what good ideas it brings to the table are mostly left unrealized. With that said, I'm not mad at it. A lot of contemporary reviews describe Terror's Realm as some torturous experience that one should receive more than a lousy t-shirt as a reward for braving. It's a competent experience in that it knows what it's copying enough to move the game along smoothly. It knows when to surprise you by having a monster pop out of a closet. It knows when to gift you ammo or a new weapon. It's just that it's often charmless, repetitive, and unrewarding. In some other reviews I came across, both published in magazines or websites, sites and user submitted ones, you'll unsurprisingly come across the phrase, so bad it's good. I have an uneasy relationship with this phrase, much like guilty pleasure. I think there are bits of quality in the Ring Terror's realm, things it at the very least doesn't completely fuck up, and decisions, intentional or not, that are funny. Having a character in what is posing as a survival horror game say lines like, you can't make fun of magic in Asia, is amusing, but I don't think I'd extend that to a recommendation, especially if I am to qualify that with if you can find it for cheap, which some reviews do include, and you won't. That's just the way old obscure games go, certainly now. Despite everything that makes up this product, this video game being easily replicable, some joy kill is going to put it on eBay for $800 where it will just sit there with nobody enjoying it. A permanent record of gamer avarice. So you could buy it from Walmart, which is incredibly easy to do, but then like, why bother? If you're not spending money, you're exerting energy to acquire this game. And at, at that point, why not just steal a good game? Did you hear it? Thank you for watching my video. This is the end of it. Hope you enjoyed it. Sorry, there was a bit of a break between uploads there, but you know, Things things came up. It's a bit it's a bit like that uh, Jurassic Park quote that I, I believe goes, "Life f finds a brick and throws it at you sometimes." So that happened for a bit. But uh, I appreciate your viewership, your support. Uh, w without which um, that brick would would have been much more debilitating. <laughs> brick might have put me down for the count. Anyway. Hope you're doing all right. Thank you for watching again. And a special thanks to Ailing Gunkle, two password for kids, a guy in a jacket, Alex, 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 Alex Raymond, Alexander Smith, Alexander Sundin, Andre Perkins, Baird Brown, Ben Carnell, Pizza Shift, Daphne Pittendry, Dark Raptor 86, Dr. Beard, Dos Days, Edward Avila, Fart Mother, Game Master, Garrett Gavinus, Godi McGork, Gregarious, J. Alamin, Joseph Zanoni, Carrot, Marcus Chani, Mundane, Nekat the Brave, News Time, Octo, Oisto, Philip Woolley, Resurrection, Ruibi Somem. See, this is where you fucked up because I immediately became scared that it was a name I wouldn't be able to pronounce. I s pronounced it in my head before I said it out loud, because I didn't want to embarrass myself. Having said that, you did give me money, so it is sock on these nuts. Salvatore Tosti. Sammy! Stukabliat. This deal is getting better all the time. Turts. Whip it out. XX Darkened Streams Fan XX. Crash Punk. Avener. Face. Giraffa. Sergei Voronsov. A Hanging Chad. Brozoof Jones. Cantankerous. Donut Stalker. Dubs. High Food Court. Ishanji. Mad Monty 98. Mirden Emrys. Nafiz Huck. Ophelia Fishwife. P. Dizzle. Persian Air. Robert Brandon. Samuel Ward. Technica. Alistair Stewart, Alexander Olbrick, Alexander Schultz, Andrew Light, Andy Krieger, Atari Steed, Ben and Kara Dowling, Big Honk, Bishy93, Brandon McFadden, Brett Weaver, Brody Gibson, Colby, Colt of Lita, Dan Cullen, Daniel Streb, David Fromke, David Harpstreit, Dazed Clockwork, Example Username, Haley Bobella, Hitoshi-san, Jake Desi, Jake Raynor, James Bloom, James Hashimoto, Jordan Balzano, J Raptor, Captain Ketchup, M, Mandalore Gaming, Max Cohen, Maximum Stupid, MCR, Michael, Miles Phillips, More Sharks, Mystical Lint, Name Requires DLC, Nick Hill, Nick Timmins, Oliver Marshall, Ombud, Opichi Costra, Quinn McElroy, Robert, Roland, Scofflaw D, Saab Akaduka, Spooky, Swood Operator, Travis Houston, Four Hour Depression Nap, Adam Page, Adrian, AI, Alec Die, Anarchy Parrot, Andre Kalganov, Our Attack, Eris Alessandrakis, Arminius J, Arches Knight, Aubrey, Austin Scott, Barbecue Jr., Beardicus, Ben Saxon, Ben White, Benjamin Judah Phelps, Big Cheese 1000, Binary Vision, Bindle, Blatherus, Bloodclat Mentality, Boris Rombold, Brendan Naftal, Byron Callum, 
Calavera, Cannon Go Boom, Cat Hands, Chris Jordan, Chris Tallarico, Colin Boyd, Colton Rowe, Commissar, Connor Sullivan, Cortland Crochet, Crispy, DS Carmen, Delaminek, Dan Richardson, Daniel Person, Dark Cloud 402, David Quinn, David Offord, Declan J. Keen, Der Commissar, Dilda, DJ Necroman, Doxupine, Dreadhead, Edward Crawford, El Jazguar, Enzo, Ersandro, Fazy, Fix My Brain, Frodo Ballbag, Jeremy Tibbles, Greg Buchold, Greg McKee, I Would Rather Prefer to Remain Anonymous, INTJ Loves Her INTP, Evo Zap, Jay Marshall, James Young, Jared Siri, Jean-Philippe Melouin, Jessica, JK, Joe Jameson, Joe Face, Jojo Evans, June Choi, Jovan Jameson, Justin Stewart, Khalil Corey, Kevin Sullivan, Chris Odie, KS, Lori Kubri, Lazar Nachekov, League of Struggle, Leland Miliokis, Leon Hooks, Lorelei, Lost Via Domus, Lucas Kettner, Major Millions, Mangy Mongrel, Marcelo Camargo, Matt Bastard, Megan Carmody, Micah J. Best, Michael King, Michael Monstry, Michael Pelican, Mike Garza, Mocha, Moonpix, Mr. Sark, Mr. Bujangles, Q Chan, Nameless, Nikita Denisov, Nuan Sonar, Olympus 3DX, Omar Yid, Otter Soldier, Papa Perk, Pen Knight 89, Petrus Montanu, Pika T, Please Keep Making Videos, Roosevelt's Big Stick, Roy Gendron, Scoss 117, Scott Aldridge, Sean, Sean Clausen, Sergei Vidovin, Sleepy Poss, Smokey Jefferson, Sonata Fanatica, Spaceman Spiff, Spider, Steinuel, Steph Van Andel, Steve, Strakinya Redenkovic, Sweet Pete, the, the, uh, um, happy, happy holidays, you guys. Thanks, Pete. Sydney Steverson. T. Grimbeard just informed me I can change my name on Patreon, so let's have some fun with the guy. Seven! I, I don't know if you're okay with, with me doing the same bit every time, but okay. Terranism. The Sleepiest Sarah. Tino Richter. Titan. Totally Not a Mimic. Trenton Wilkins. Turbobra. Tyler F. Vargar. Vivitis. Volpix Chick. Ween Supreme. Yak Spiker. Eves Yang. Zachariah I am. Zdjenek Benez. Zin. 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 <laughs> Zubertuber. Arsile Markusen. A perfectly normal human being and definitely not a dog that learned how to use a computer. AJ Leroy. Ale Carpenter. A Bonkers Chicken. Adolency. Adrian Fachi. Adventure Game Geek. Alex Hanna. Alexis Pinsenalt. Anthony Daniel. Austin Mathis. Baker. Big Hubert. Boop Butt. Brad. Brian Sanson. BS Fam. B. Southby, Kaz, Chicken Legs, Christian Danny Storgard, Christopher White Schneider, CMG161, Creepy Lounge Lizard, Krylar, David Moreau, Drenched, Drunk Taco, Earth Go Hard, Fabulous Freckles, Feeder Goldfish, Gamercot, Gamesbrit, Gargantua, Gato Malo, Half Asian Viking, Harry Sykes, Hashi Singh, Hinchis, Homeboy Dirtbag, We Lay, Ignacio de Guglielmi, IP68, Isabella Stoner, J Dog 3433, Jed Grahek, Jeep Pete, Joe Reynolds, Johan Kavand, John Z, Jonas Kingo, Jonathan Becker, Jonathanis Eddy, Josh B, Joshua McLarnin, Yoni Niamela, Yuha Kauri, Kakun, Karen Mayville, Kevin Thurber, Krampic Newt, Laz Lowe, Lucas, Level Zero, Matthias Waltman, Melly, Melon, Miguel Amaro, Mind Like Water, Yargar, Niall McCorkendale, Nicholas Monroe, OK Cat Dad, Otavio Albanesi, Pedro Costum, Phony Soprano, Piotr Sankowski, Professor Nex, Pixelfish, Ricky Gas, Ricky Rigatoni, Rith, Rotten Hams, Ryan Hollinger, Ryan McLeod, Sam C, Samage, Schluff, Schwabalaba, Schwa. Shwa Shwan McDonald Sean McDonald Seaway Jerk Sentient Turtle Sir Tristan Silvano Gonzalez Sinan the Montoya Sir Alohomora Slava Saknyanko Slavic Dreams Snow Lame Solarbox Stephen Laflame Subdermal Cassette Loader Super Dunman Sven Grell Sinoise Surprise Tatami Guy Tess Dunn The Gaming Beehive Little B The Real Call L The Magnificent Spud The Super Pickle Uncle Dozer TV Val Halverson Valinora Venetian Red Vincent Cronin, Vinculus, Visitor Information, Warhopper, Whiskey Grenade, Your Patron, Yuko Vallis, Zachary Scharf, ZJ, One Iserlo, Adrian, Alberto Ferreira Valverde, Alex Armybull, Alex Yui, Allegory, Alpaca Omega, Feeder of Blood, Anna Trans Rights Exo, Andre Kurenkov, Anna Nuff, Astro Shepard, Azroy, Bertigan, Basti, Bertie Bertig, Big Death Energy, Bitmatter, Bloodworth, Bo, Bobson Jr., Boye, Bones Malones, Brand Faust, Brandon Shock, Bubblegum Curapop, Buckaroo, 
Cabbage, Cam, Cassidy Mosier, Chalabard, Chef Toker, Chonko Ronko, Chris Barb, Chunkus Manhunkus, Clinton Attaway, Cloister 56, Conrad Eastman, Cryptid John, Dalton McCabe, Dan Zinski, Daniel Gen, Daniel Newberry, Danny D, Dantic K3, David Badzinski, Dead Alewives, Delta, Damar, Dezu, Div, Deveth Faust, Domingo Carlo Martinez, Dust Sucker, Ed Mofilo, Edward McQuinn, Edward Wheeler, Eggs McGomlet, Emmett Arthur, Epic Dude 467, Eric Leong, Eric Lawn, Eugene Balder, Fitzgerald 93, Florian Vogel, Franziska Dimitrovska, Frank, Frantic Atlantic, Freaky Demon, Franz, Genuine Chillcast, Gianni Matrograno, Gideon Joubert, Guy, Guifa, HL Longboy, Hannes Jacoby, Hazel Connor, Haimo Statman, Hofflerand, I Faw Down, Ian, Ian Baranek, Ikifu, Incorrect Beans, Inky, Inside My Strange Place, Isaac, Jacob Hanley, Jacob Gardner, Jalcor, James Lambert, JCL 300, Jick Magger, John Adams, John Araho, John Bromley, John Kamich, John Stone, Joshua Khan, Joshua Stewart, Justavian, Khalifas, Casey Ghoul, Kekon Sehin, Kimia, Kirano, Kyle Williams, Lefazar, Laura Harwood, Lauren, Lauren Miller, Leonardo Antonio Aquasanta, Louis Quinn Whalen, Low C, Lucas Mendel, Luke Gazaway, Lynn Lovett, Magno Dick, Magnum Opas, Manu Weidman, Mara Alina, Mark A, Matt Clark, Matt Chester, Matthew Arrowwood, Mage Wynn, Metal Crew, Michael B, Michael Splinter Mara Emery, Mike McMuscles, Mikey Tambourine, Mojave Jade, Moral, Morgan Harper, Mongo Jerry, Nagru, Nathaniel Clark, Nathaniel Dolinchuk, Necro Anal Crusher, Negative Creep, Nick Johnson, Noel Marquez, Octo, Pagan Butler, Peach, Pentagon Black, People Are Under a Lot of Stress, Putty, Perennial Astronaut, Farce Face, Phoenix Flames, Frand, Piotr Skubawa, Poet Russell, Pommy, Popeye Bark, Prod Mage, QL2040, Quirky Top Hat, Rachel Rose, Rasmus Karras, Raul Vidal, Razzle Dazzle B13, Red, Red OKB, Reflect, Rayo Palmiste, Replicant, Ruben, Robert Chernovsky, Robert McMahon, Robert Scotland, Roose Roosevelt Hoover IV, Ryan Malone, Saint, Samantha Wells, Sammy 3D, Sarah Denman, Scott Valine, Sean Bradford, Shazbot101, Shampamite, Sean Tiva, Snail85, Someone Finds Finally pays me, Stanislav, Summer Storm, Sweeneasy, Tayano Sandman, That One Guy, That Taffer, This Sid Four, Thomas Caldickery, Thy Rourke, Timothy, Tony Brandt, Tony Gleed, Soros, Unpolished Mirror, BK, Van the Cheesen, Vincent Liu, Vlad M, Bukrulez, Wendigo, A Fear Worth Living, Webgoth, Who Done It? Widukind, Wilhelm Schroederheim, Will M, William Riker, Woe Potato, Walrek, Zan, Extreme Steve, Yossarian, Yuki Cyan, Zachary Schulstad, Zane Brake, and Siklau for being a patron. Thank you so much for your continued support, especially uh, right now where I have to very quickly find another place to live. And uh, I, I found out that I needed to do that right after I, I uh, splurged on dental work. <laughs> Hell yeah, let's go. Oh, I can't live here anymore? Bummer. Anyway, uh, still stressed out about it. Uh, no doubt there. S substantially less stressed out because I got you and you got my back. I will do my best to not have that interrupt a steady flow of premium, pretty good content. Hope you guys are doing okay. Hope you're staying goth. Hope you're staying gaming. I will see you uh, in the next video. I don't know why I said that like I had, that's my sign off. I'll see you later. You're never alone. They're tracking.